Theosophy, in its abstract meaning, is divine wisdom, or the aggregate of the knowledge and wisdom that underlie the universe, the homogeneity of eternal good, and in its concrete sense, it is the sum total of the same as allotted to man by nature on this earth and no more. This concise statement of what theosophy is hints at the language of divine thought and those limitations set for us at this point in human evolution. Note that good is in capital letters. Why? One reason is that this is not good as we typically use the term, a good deed, a good apple, a good way to look at a problem, and so on. It is eternal good. What is that? What is its relation to everything we consider good in our everyday world? Whatever it is, it is beyond time and condition, place and situation, for it is eternal. The source of all the reflected goods of Maya, our world as we ordinarily experience it. And we are told that it is homogenous, a unity, unlike the diversity of goods we experience day to day. Further, we are told that divine wisdom is all the knowledge and wisdom behind the universe, and this is the eternal good. This is theosophy, but not quite. For in its concrete sense, that is, theosophy as we have it, is only what is allotted by nature to human beings on this earth. Theosophy, then, is that portion of theosophia that nature allows us at this time in the evolution of humanity. Despite this limitation, anyone who has studied the secret doctrine even a little knows that what we have been given will take lifetimes to absorb. And there is more in this quotation. What is this nature that allots theosophy to us? It is clearly much more than the trees, birds, flowers, and flowing streams that we perceive on a walk through what we call nature. It is also human nature, for we can assimilate only what we are prepared to assimilate. Take a simple example. A biologist, a physicist, a philosopher, and a poet are walking together through a forest that contains within its bounds a meadow and a stream. Will they all see the same things? Yes, in a very general sense. But the poet may sense the harmony of it all and feel in her heart the unity of nature. The biologist may marvel at the diversity of living forms and sense their interconnectedness. The physicist may think of the trillions upon trillions of atoms arranged into these forms. And the philosopher may sense a unity behind the diversity that he cannot express in words. So how are we to articulate the knowledge and wisdom that underlie what we experience. H.P. Blavatsky is quite clear on this question. Everyday language allows us to share ideas, buy groceries and other items we need to live, and describe our emotions, at least to some extent. But it cannot express what lies behind everyday experience. It cannot fully express our deepest intuitions, and certainly cannot express the good. And when HPB tries to explain abstractions, numinal matters only accessible to the refined spiritual states of consciousness, she complains on various occasions about the limits of the English language, and by implication, European languages in general. Sanskrit is much better at such expressions, largely because its speakers and readers were interested in the nature of consciousness long before the West took up the subject. Philosophers such as the Neoplatonists, 
and especially Amblichus, were aware of levels of consciousness. But that awareness was not pursued in any significant way until the philosopher and psychologist William James examined them late in the 19th century. Yet early in the 20th century, such interest was narrowed into a rather limited range of psychology. Thanks largely to HPB and those who have studied her writings, the turn of our millennium has seen renewed philosophical and psychological interest in consciousness. If language is ordinarily conceived, cannot easily discuss matters that transcend the ordinary experiences of most human beings, how can those matters be explained? HPB clearly states that the hidden history of the world is recorded in symbols and glyphs. Universal symbolism, our concern at this conference, is the language that can express at every level relative truths that approach the ultimate good, though one has to learn how to grasp and understand them. So what are symbols? And what are universal symbols? A quick survey of the secret doctrine alone shows that HPB uses the word symbol, symbolism, and symbolic over 1,000 times in just those two volumes. Clearly, the subject is of fundamental importance in theosophy as she presented it. Although we use words casually and mix them up, we can distinguish between labels, signs, and symbols. A label merely identifies something. Seeing the word pepper on a glass jar tells us that it contains pepper. Signs often do that but equally often they give direction or indicate an action to be taken. So the red traffic light or the red octagon with stop written on it tells us to stop our automobile at this point. Symbols are more than either signs or labels. What is a symbol for one person, however, may be nothing more than a label for another. Take, for example, the little cross that some Christians wear on a chain around their necks. For an individual who has studied the cross as explained in the second volume of the Secret Doctrine, it is not just a symbol of Christianity, but much more. For another person, it is a sign that identifies the wearer as a Christian, thereby suggesting ways of talking with the person, though one does not know what being a Christian actually means for the bearer of this sign. Or, to one not really interested in the individual with the cross, it may just be a label identifying the wearer as Christian rather than, say, Jewish or atheist. Symbols have been said by various writers to participate in what they symbolize. William Kwan Judge suggests what this participation means when he said, A symbol, to be properly so called, must be contained in the idea or ideas which it is intended to represent. This does not mean that the symbol has to be the whole of what is symbolized, but it must be part of it in some way. He adds, to be a just and correct symbol, it should be such that the moment it is seen by one versed in symbolism, its meaning and application becomes easily apparent. Yet, in the secret doctrine, we see many pages devoted to the explanation of various symbols, often as they manifest in various traditions. So how do they become easily apparent to one versed in symbolism? There are at least two reasons for this view of symbols. First, Most human beings recognize that mastering a specialized subject, for example, quantum physics, advanced mathematics, or cellular biology, requires undertaking some years of rigorous study and discipline and involving learning many things. But curiously, 
When it comes to the spiritual life, many people seem to think that a few techniques and beliefs will make one competent in that life. Viewed in this way, such a stance makes no sense at all. Consciousness is not simple awareness limited by our sense organs. Rather, it is immensely complex, and our understanding of it and its powers and possibilities require sustained effort on our part. HPB said that the brain must become porous to higher dimensions of relative reality for the mind to encompass and apply those higher and more fundamental degrees of consciousness. The program for developing such consciousness is set out in The Voice of the Silence, the Bhagavad Gita, and Light on the Path, among other equally spiritual works. W.Q. Judge's qualifying phrase is seen by one versed in symbolism. And becoming versed in symbolism requires the same rigor which must be brought to all aspects of the spiritual life. HPB illustrates what this means in her lengthy discussions of symbolism and specific symbols. The second reason is perhaps subtler. Anyone familiar with the secret doctrine knows that any particular subject, such as the seven cosmic and human principles, karma, the absolute, the monad, or any other subject, is addressed multiple times. Remarks are found spread throughout both volumes of the book. Why did HPB write in this way? Why not put everything that could and needed to be said in one place in the text? Commander Bowen belonged to a small group that met periodically with HPB, and he took notes on what she shared. She saw and approved of these notes as an accurate account of her words. In them, she said that the pathway of the West, the path of those born in the Western world, is jnana, the way of knowledge and wisdom. This is a reference to the three yogas found in the Bhagavad Gita, jnana, bhakti, and karma yoga. As Krishna in the Gita makes clear, the three entail one another for mastery. If one is to gain any real knowledge, jnana, one will have to be devoted to that which one aspires to, a teacher, a teaching, a goal. This is bhakti yoga. And one will have to apply what one learns and thus reorient one's actions in the world and one's relationship to humanity in light of what one understands. This is karma yoga. One cannot act effectively without knowledge and indeed wisdom. And one cannot claim to be devoted without learning and acting accordingly. When HPB said that the Westerner's path is the way of knowledge, she was indicating the mindset of the Western world, much of which has now affected the whole globe. The way she wrote the secret doctrine is quite purposive. Anyone can read this remarkable text superficially and many did just that in her day, and find little but confusion in it. The serious student of this book ponders every sentence, and even every word, carefully, in context, and in relation to what else is said elsewhere in the book and in her other writings. That is, much effort is involved in understanding. This is what makes the brain porous to more profound levels of consciousness levels increasingly closer to what one is, in fact, as a human being. Put bluntly, we are striving to become fully human, to become man in the profound theosophical sense, to increasingly embody what we eternally are, even in this transient and illusionary world. In studying the secret doctrine and other theosophical materials, we are engaged in opening consciousness to ever richer and fuller realization of all existence and that which is beyond.
moving from relative truths to ever less relative truths in a pilgrimage that embodies the evolutionary process of humanity through rounds and races. For the Western mind, Shnana is the most useful way to start. And many of us, however long we have been students of theosophy, are starters in this sense. Now, what has all this to do with symbols? We may think of the secret doctrine as a presentation of cosmology and human evolution, and it certainly is that. We can also understand the secret doctrine as training materials for the mind, not just the rational discursive thinking process, but <clears throat> manas, the mind that is reflected in those processes, and the higher mind that can be awakened through the yogas just discussed. It is not a manual in the sense of a step-by-step -step explanation of how to put <clears throat> some, something together, because what it contains will be understood at different levels by different individuals. And so each person will use what he or she can. With repeated study, one's understanding will deepen as one, one's consciousness becomes increasingly flexible. Universal symbols, those discussed by HPB throughout the secret doctrine, are central to that training. Thinking about them, reflecting on them, meditating on them, loosens the confining stricture that have been placed on our consciousness by birth, karma, social convention, and too often, education. Put simply, symbols operate at many levels. Symbols, then, are reflections of truth at the various levels on which they are understood. But we can ask, why so much material on symbols, their origin, history, and meaning? Why not just say what they mean? Once again, we find two answers. In speaking of the founders of various religions, HPB notes that no founder invents a new religion. Rather, they were all transmitters of universal truths that do not change. Each founder selected from those truths a grand portion of which were given to humanity at the dawn of human evolution but which have been lost, obscured, or distorted <clears throat> over time. They are preserved in the mysteries, and religious founders drew from them what was suitable and usable to the communities they taught. She said, Thus every nation received in its turn some of the said truths under the veil of its own local and special symbolism. Over time, these teachings are invariably degraded in the hands of unenlightened human beings who think they know fully what they know only partially, if at all. Mixed with the desires of our lower natures, universal truths become localized, concretized, confused, and even forgotten entirely. So the first answer to the question, why not just say what symbols mean, is that the degradation and obscuration of universal symbols has to be cleared away. She did this by analyzing select universal symbols, showing that they are indeed universal, found all over the world, and discussing their nature and development. In doing so, HPB stripped away the local and exotic details to allow the symbol to appear in its pure form. Since symbols require interpretation for the discursive mind, lower manas, we must be prepared in order to understand them. For each of us, this means clearing the mind of prejudice, bias, proclivities, and tendencies to ignorantly see what we want to see. This purgation includes undertaking the effort to understand for the sake of all, not for one's illusory persona. Being open to receiving the meaning of a symbol, being able to reflect its meaning in consciousness, 
is not entering some passive state of consciousness, but an activity of cleansing and focusing the mind. The second answer to the question, why not just say what symbols mean, is that each symbol has seven keys to its meaning. HPB spoke of these keys in various ways, perhaps because each of these keys is itself sevenfold. A truly universal symbol will be meaningful at every level of consciousness and reflect truth at each of those levels. And so a symbol is as rich as consciousness itself. In a telling footnote, when discussing the very sacred symbol of the Logos, the breath crystallized into the word, she wrote, It is hardly necessary to remind the reader once more that the term divine thought, like that of universal mind, which must not be regarded as even vaguely shadowing forth an intellectual process akin to that exhibited by man. Only those who realize how far intuition soars above the tardy processes of ratiocinative thought can, the, can form the faintest conception of the absolute wisdom which transcends the ideas of time and space. This remark reveals why universal symbols require great effort to understand at any but the most superficial level. HPB warned in the secret doctrine that to some extent it is admitted that even the esoteric teaching is allegorical. To make the latter comprehensible to the average intelligence requires the use of symbols cast in an intelligible form. In discussing the deep history of humanity, going back millions of years to the Lemurian period, HPB mentioned the seven keys of the symbolism involved. Quote, for the comprehension of the occult doctrine, she explained, is based on that of the seven sciences. Thus, we have to deal with modes of thought on seven entirely different planes of ideality. Every text refers to, or has to be rendered from, one of the following standpoints. One, the realistic plane of thought. Two, the idealistic. Three, the purely divine or spiritual. The other planes too far transcend the average consciousness, especially of the materialistic mind, to admit their being even symbolized in terms of ordinary phraseology. End of quote. So we are not given all the keys because we could not comprehend them. And she added, when mortals shall have become sufficiently spiritualized, there will be no more need of forcing them into a correct comprehension of wisdom. The keys are related then to planes of thought, and they are modes of interpretation or ways of reading the symbols. Not all symbols are universal, of course, but HVB indicates many that are, including the circle, the square, fire, the serpents following its tail, the lotus and its variations, the cross in its various forms, and so on. Universal symbols can be understood then at seven cosmic and human levels. <clears throat> Yet we are not given some of the keys. Speaking of the one universal myth behind the stories of spirits peopling the earth, found in many traditions, she said that, quote, the whole essence of truth cannot be transmitted from mouth to ear. This suggests that even the teacher cannot give the disciple everything. She continued, nor can any pen describe it, not even that of the recording angel, unless man finds the answer in the sanctuary of his own heart. The level of consciousness from which one reflects on a symbol or myth determines what may be comprehended. And so the keys are intimately associated with the seven human principles. In this case, HVB said that she was interpreting the myth on only two planes, the philosophical and the intellectual, with three keys. Four, 
he said. The last four keys of the seven that throw open the portals to the mysteries of nature are in the hands of the highest initiates and cannot be divulged to the masses at large. Not this, our century, at any rate. Now we can see several reasons why we are not simply given a list of seven keys. First and foremost, we must be prepared in consciousness, not just in the head, but in the heart, to discern the meanings of any universal symbol. If the secret doctrine and other writings are materials for preparing the mind, the voice of the silence is the manual for awakening the heart. Here, jnana and real bhakti are prerequisites of karma yoga, action that uplifts the world and furthers human evolution. Only through the use in practice of the materials at hand will we turn the keys of universal symbolism. We see HPB naming the keys she employed throughout the secret doctrine, sometimes calling them interpretations of symbols. A quick survey shows at least 24 named keys. There are likely others that this student has missed. There are many more than seven. Are some of these terms synonyms? Are some just keys in a less exalted sense of the word? Or, given the association of keys with the cosmic and human principles, both of which are each sevenfold, connected to the 49 fires spoken of in volume two, are we sometimes given a key and sometimes a sub-key? Once again, we see that context is important in understanding what is being said. HPB also told us something else. Bohat is the key in occultism, which opens and unriddles the multiform symbols and respective allegories in the so-called mythology of every nation. And near the end of all that she said about symbols in her two volumes in The Secret Doctrine, she wrote, The few instances and examples brought forward reveal only one small portion of the methods used to read the symbolical ideographs and numerals of antiquity. The system being of an extreme and complex difficulty, very few, even among the initiates, could master all the seven keys. All this can seem to be overwhelming, but we are often reminded to recognize and acknowledge our limitations, but not to dwell on them. Rather, we are advised to look forward, appreciating our possibilities and self-devised promise. Paradoxically, this looking forward is also looking far, far back into what we originally are and what we were given. We are invited to start where we are. Symbols invite penetration into their enigmatic nature, which is suffused with what they point to. They point to the knowledge once given very early humanity, knowledge that we have all had and still have, no matter how obscured it has become through our many incarnations. Meditating and reflection on them awaken what we know in our highest natures, bringing the eternal wisdom evermore into our incarnated consciousness. HV indicated that the secret doctrine, what was offered to humanity just a few years ago, is only the tip of the iceberg, visible to us, but only suggesting the vast depths of theosophia that enlightened beings plumb. Our conference will explore symbols and their golden invitation to deepen our understanding and raise our consciousness to ever higher levels of understanding. Over the next days, we will taste, each in our own way, something of the language of divine thought. First, we will explore universal symbols and what constitutes such a symbol. Then we will take man, the thinking being, as a symbol of nature, 
intelligent everywhere, but thinking in the human being. And then we will consider symbols as the preservation of divine thought, ever holding the truths of Theosophia for those who seek to recover it in consciousness. And this is the topmost tip of the iceberg. And yet, it is where the sunlight of the spiritual sun shines most luminously for us. Together, our conversation and exploration will reflect the brotherhood and sisterhood taught by theosophy. If we hold this spirit in our hearts and we work together, we will uplift ourselves and thereby assist humanity and indeed all nature. May we make good use of this privileged time together. Let us close with this highly relevant quotation from HPB. Meditation, abstinence in all, the observation of moral duties, gentle thoughts, good deeds, and kind words, as goodwill to all and entire oblivion of self, are the most efficacious means of obtaining knowledge and preparing for the reception of higher wisdom. So may we be guided. Thank you.